It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Matthew Winkler, the founder of Bloomberg News and its editor-in-chief emeritus since 2015. I'm delighted he has agreed to be here to deliver the luncheon speech of the Center in Capitalism and Society's 14th Annual Conference. Matthew Winkler is an unparalleled figure in American news. In 1990, he co-founded Bloomberg News with Michael Bloomberg. Over the next 25 years, he went on to transform the company into an international media empire with 150 bureaus in 73 countries, employing 2,300 writers and editors. Bloomberg News includes a global television network, radio station, website, subscription-only newsletters, and two magazines, Bloomberg Business Week and Bloomberg Markets. Prior to co-founding Bloomberg News, Matt was a reporter and editor, first at the Mount Vernon News in Ohio. Interesting to know whether that's still around. It is, okay. Then at the Bond Buyer and later at the Wall Street Journal and Barron's. Between 1991 and 1994, Matt also wrote the Capital Markets column for Forbes magazine. He's the co-author of the book Bloomberg by Bloomberg and the author of The Bloomberg Way, which has been called the News Services Bible. So without further ado, I welcome you to um, Matthew Winkler. Thank you, Professor Phelps, for that very generous introduction. And um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you. I, I should say I, I come to this meeting, as you just learned, as a journalist. And I'm focused on corporate, economic, and investment data. Um, that's been my uh, specialty and avocation for many decades now. And I'm particularly interested in that data as a way to provide a perspective of the past year, which I think is, is why Professor Phelps actually asked me to come, because as we all know, um, there was an election recently, and the outcome was something of a surprise. And already missing probably from the narrative of this momentous event is that um, only five times in American history has the uh, winner of the popular vote been a loser. Um, and if the estimates are accurate, and it looks like by the day they are, uh, Clinton will have won the vote by a margin of more than two million votes. Um, and they're still piling up in California um, as we speak. But as you know, the media, my profession, has a tendency to favor winners, whoever they are, regardless of the circumstances. And this election so far shows no deviation from that tendency. And I say this because the historical fact of more Americans voting for Clinton by such a significant margin might help explain the data that I'm about to share with you that, as I said, was mostly missing from uh, the narrative, the discussion over the past year. The first, and I want to thank my colleague Sasha Graff, who's my chief of staff, for um, being able to present these slides um, as I show them to you. The GDP of major economies over the past 30 years is what you're looking at. The US is the green line. Um, Eurozone is yellow. China, which, as you know, is still a developing economy, not a developed economy, is red, but I put that in here because it's number two. Japan is white, Germany is orange, UK is blue, and Canada is pink. And as you can see from this picture in front of you, there's only one line that is going up. The rest have rolled over since, I like to say, the worst 
recession since the Great Depression. I know everybody likes to use that word Great Recession, but I think it confuses more than clarifies. It was the worst recession since the Great Depression and probably comes closest, were it not for the intervention of policymakers, of being another Great Depression. Um, and uh, that's why it's worth showing here. And then a bigger snapshot is what's happened since 2008. The US is the only major developed economy the only major developed country with record GDP since 2008. Um, again, the US is green, Eurozone is yellow, Japan is white, Germany is orange, UK is blue, and Canada is pink. I dare say at no point on any nightly news, morning news, <coughs> evening news, online, in the whole discussion of whether the US economy this past year was there ever the mention, even parenthetically, that the US is the only developed economy in the world that has record GDP? So that's why I share that with you, okay? No one has pointed that out. And again, I'm not an economist. I am just a newspaper man, really. That's where I began, and all I do is just observe the data as it presents itself. Now let's turn to the workforce. The numbers, number of workers in the US to assemble motor vehicles and parts increased 48% from 623,000 people in June 2009, which you could argue was the worst point of the recession, to 932,000 currently, and that's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And as you can see, it's quite a dramatic improvement from where we were. That's a 48% increase in the number of workers assembling motor vehicles and parts. Now let's juxtapose that, let's go to another one. The number of workers in the US construction industry increased 23% from 5.4 million in 2011 to the current 6.7 million. And then again, that's according to the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics. And again, I'm sharing with you data that is empirically verified, that is instantly replicated, and so far I think you will agree with me, rarely did this data ever get into broadcast news at any time in the discussion of whether the US in 2016. The next piece of data is total employment in the United States, and this is non-farm payrolls, and this increased 10% during this same period, since June 2009, and the current total is 145 million jobs. Now, just put these three pictures in perspective. The big picture, of course, is non-farm payrolls went up 10%. So that's everybody's jobs all thrown into the same mix, up 10%. The, the specific group of workers that did the best under President Obama happened to be people who were making cars and construction, just for what it's worth, okay? And I'm just showing you data that was there. Next slide is since Obama took office in 2009, and you remember uh, that year, um, the pessimism was pretty prevalent, um, to say the least. The stock market, as measured by the S&P 500, probably hit its low around the first week of March 2009. Um, very few people were um, bullish on the US. There was only one major investor, in fact, who was, and that was Warren Buffett. And you recall he had just bought some railroads, um, which gave you some idea of where he thought things were going. But in any case, he bought some railroads. And manufacturing jobs since that time increased 7%. Now, you might think that that's a relatively small number, and um, in some ways it is, but it happens to be the biggest percentage increase during one president's tenure since the 8% increase when Lyndon Johnson was president between 1963 and 1968. So another piece of context and perspective, I think, that was missing from the political narrative. Now let's go to trade, which unfortunately was essentially given up as a subject, any kind of redeeming value in trade, free trade. 
As the trade deficit of goods since 2011 um, is what we're looking at, uh, trade surplus of services is still growing. And we look at it, the wage over labor grows 8% since 2011. Service wage gains 50, 15%. I just want to pause and look at this for a second because this is a rather complicated chart. We have a trade surplus of services. <coughs> trade surplus of services. One of the biggest components of US trade is our services, often completely missed in the discussion of trade, NAFTA, everything else. One of the big exports that we have in this country is our services. This is trade surplus of 41%. The trade deficit of goods more or less continues um, in a predictable pattern. Service wages gained 15% as overall wages gained 8%. I'm not making a judgment here, but I am just sharing with you a reality, which is that America still is an exporter, but one of the things it exports is services. Again, I found it hard to find any kind of sober discussion of that at any point, um, even in print journalism, um, on a daily basis. So, so far we have this conclusion. Blue collar, if you want to call them that, blue collar workers go back to work to get jobs faster than any other type of industry. Many blue collar workers may have moved to the service industry where there are higher and arguably greater opportunities for compensation, accelerating compensation. That's what those slides suggest. So now let's look at back to GDP. When we look at GDP growth of the US, it's been slowing to 1.5% this year. It's projected to grow 2.1% in the next two years. However, and one thing that we try to do at Bloomberg is look at everything in the context of relative value. The only way one can understand anything is its relative value. So when we look at where the US is relative to everybody else in the world, and we're looking at the developed economies, slowing down is obviously a big problem and a big issue. But the US is still performing better than any developed economy so far. And you know, I've highlighted the US uh, category in green, but if you look at uh, every country mentioned here, Germany, the UK, France, Canada, Italy, Japan, and Russia, you can see that not only in 16, but 17 and 18, the performance isn't as good. So now let's turn to uh, a favorite subject of mine, and I know a lot of economists, um, infrastructure and government spending. Um, and I want to turn specifically to of all places, Colorado. Because it's a really good example, I think, of what happens when infrastructure is done in a very big way and how does it affect the economy. Colorado, you may recall, in the 1980s, when Federica Pena was the mayor of Denver, was actually losing population for the first time in its history as a state. It was losing population. Denver was a shadow of its former self and um, the outlook was bleak by the late 80s. And the mayor, with a very bipartisan uh, group of people, businessmen, uh, put forth a proposal to create what would be, when it turns out to be, the first and only major new airport since Dallas-Fort Worth in the early 70s, the Denver International Airport. At the time, it ran into much criticism. It was considered a boondoggle. Uh, Crandall, when he was the CEO and chairman of American Airlines, uh, actually ridiculed it as a field of dreams and said nobody would come, we don't need an airport. But if you look at what's happened to the state of Colorado, which is, of course, in the middle of the United States, landlocked, um, it's actually punched way above its weight ever since then. Um, what you have here is non-farm payrolls, 1996, to 2016, and then you have Colorado up 37% when the US was up 20%. When we look at home value appreciation in Colorado, uh, it beats the country. The home value of Colorado appreciated 137% since 1996 when the measure, same measure for the country was 95%. So 
by the way, if you go to the Denver International Airport today, it's one of the less than 20 in the United States where there are daily flights to Asia, to Europe, and Central America. Um, hard to say that about a, you know, anywhere that's number 22 in population, um, but it's an example of what a difference infrastructure can make in transforming an economy. And it's not just Democrats who say that, Republicans as well in the state of Colorado. Interestingly enough, in the whole <laughs> year of campaigning and people talking about infrastructure, I don't think the Denver airport was mentioned once. I don't think Colorado was mentioned once. It is a very interesting state because it is the number one destination for baby boomers and millennials alike. And that kind of tells you something right there. Okay, let's turn to one of my favorite subjects, Wall Street. There was a lot of bashing of Wall Street this year. Um, and, uh, you know, we're at 2008. I, I suspect it would be entirely legitimate, but it's now 2016. And what we can show when we look at the things that Wall Street deals with is that household debt burden is way down, home equity values have come back, loans are more available. Just look at the Federal Reserve data of banks' willingness to lend and the bad, la bad loan ratio is down as well. So Americans right now, this slide that you're looking at, are within five percentage points of the all-time high valuation of their homes in 2006. Now everybody knows how terrible the financial crisis was, how devastating it was. So to understand, and it was the first time, by the way, in our lifetimes that housing values actually went down. Everybody until 2008 believed that your home was secure and it would see nothing but appreciation now and in the hereafter. Obviously, that wasn't true. Um, but if we look at where we are today, you can see that there's been a dramatic recovery in uh, people's biggest possession. Another piece of data that's interesting, which is household debt payments as a percentage of disposable income have plummeted to 10% from 13.22% in 2007. Now that's a really important data because that says that Americans are actually in a better situation in terms of debt than they've been in a very long time, a very long time. They're healthier. Let's turn back to labor. The labor participation rate has gone up to 62.8% from 62.4%. Not great numbers, you might say, except that this 12-month gain ending last month is the biggest advance since 1989. And, you know, as a newsman, I always get, what, what gets my attention are superlatives. So that's a pretty interesting superlative, that you would see that kind of dramatic increase since 1989. Needless to say, I think you'll agree with me, almost everything I've shared with you so far you didn't even see debated um, on anybody's news. Now let's turn to my favorite state, California, which I referenced at the outset of this, this discussion. In 2015, the gross domestic product of California advanced 5.7% to $2.5 trillion. That makes it one-seventh of the U.S. economy. There are 50 states. California is one-seventh of those 50 states in terms of GDP. The rest of the U.S., by the way, gained just 2.6% in 2015. So what's the significance of this? Okay, you, you read a lot and heard a lot about North Carolina. You read a lot and heard a lot about Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Florida. California created more jobs than Texas and Florida combined last year, okay? And with this GDP, it is now, it is now the fifth largest country in the world. It has supplanted in the past three years France and the UK and Brazil, not necessarily in that order. Um, and because of Brexit and because when you do the math on what the economic forecasts are this year and next year for the UK. You calculate the plummeting pound after Brexit. You wind up with California's GDP easily exceeding the UK, uh, which it was behind uh, at this time last year. But the bigger point is this about California. 
it is really a country. Um, and unlike maybe other parts of this country, it is not polarized, okay? It is, it is a country where people's preferences and public policy converge seemingly harmoniously. And um, again, what California means to the United States in terms of its GDP, in terms of its job growth, much of what it has done in the past year is just completely missing from anybody's conversation. Um, and as you can see from this chart, you see that California grew twice as fast as the rest of the United States. Another fact about California, during the past five years, the companies big and small in California, and what I'm talking about are the Russell 3000, so that's 3,000 companies. If you looked at those companies by every investment measure we have at Bloomberg, okay, return on assets, return on equity, all of the PE, everything that you can think of, companies domiciled in California outperform companies in the rest of the United States over five years and over one year, really pretty much any period. But this graph right here uh, gives you a sense of that. Okay, let's turn to debt where we are with that, because we're probably going to be talking about that for the next decade, um, increasingly. Corporations. When we look at U.S. companies today, all U.S. companies, again, let's take the Russell 3000, we find that the net debt ratio to earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, that ratio of companies, say, from the S&P 500 index. It fell to the lowest point since at least 1990, when we began compiling that data, so, which means it actually may be the lowest ever, because if you think about where interest rates are today and where they've been, um, this debt ratio of American companies may be the lowest ever. So what does that mean? It actually means because this Ratio is arguably one of the most uh, conservative measures of measuring the health of companies, means that American companies are the healthiest they've been in quite some time, maybe forever. Um, again, this is a piece of data that may seem arcane to many people, but in fact it's, it's very interesting in the context of where the United States is relative to everybody else. You can't find any kind of performance about corporate Britain, corporate France, corporate UK, corporate China, corporate Germany that comes anywhere near the performance of corporate America by this measure. Okay, so what about the American consumer? Um, when we look at the sales per share from consumer, uh, sorry, when we, there's one more thing I want to point out. When we look at this, yeah, sales from, per share from consumer discretionary companies in the S&P 500. Um, it's at a record. Now, everybody knows consumer discretionary companies, you know, those are the things we don't need compared to consumer staples. Um, the gap to the similar measure of consumer staples companies widened to a record since 2008. That's what this slide shows you. Now, growing spread could mean that consumers have the most disposable income to spend while not posting inflation concerns. I won't make that judgment, uh, leave it to people here and elsewhere to make that judgment, but this is a very interesting, um, by the way, this is a very interesting piece of data uh, to tell us sort of where we are. So um, all I wanted to do um, was elaborate a little bit on a conversation I had with Professor Phelps many months ago, um, like so many of us, the mood at the uh, meeting where we were at was pretty gloomy. Um, we, of course, did not know where things would end uh, with the election, but we were just, um, like many people, ruminating over um, seemingly how angry everybody was and despondent and so on. And yet, there was plenty of data in our midst that says, well, things may not be great. Um, they're a lot better than where they were. Thank you very much. There's time, plenty of time for questions. <clears throat> yes. 
You got one right here, and you got one right here. You uh, spoke about U.S. compared to Europe, which Europe doesn't do well in a lot of ways. Could you think some more about a 2% growth that we've been experiencing relative to, should it have been 4%? And if so, why the difference? Okay, the, I, that question is about why not 4% instead of 2%, is that right? And the answer uh, can't possibly come from me because I'm just a newsman and I just report on what I see, which is data. Uh, I try to become illuminated by talking to people like my good friend, Professor Phelps, Dr. Phelps. Um, and he has, as you well know, a very articulate um, theory and explanation about why we're not at 4%. All I do, or try to do, is just share with people as much data that is relevant to the discussion as possible. That's all I can do. So I can't give you an answer that you're seeking. You're going to have to get that from a much brighter light here than me. Nobody brighter than you, Matt. Um, Edmond Alfandri. There is a saying in France, uh, which is, uh, when I look at myself, I feel miserable. But when I compare myself to others, then I feel heartened. <laughs> when you look at the, the, the electorate of Trump and Clinton, it's, uh, I don't think that it is a, a coincidence that the electorate of Clinton is on the East and the West Coast, and the Trump electorate is in the center of America, okay. which is much, much more inward looking. Yeah. And my, 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 uh, just my, uh, my opinion is that the fact that uh, uh, the new president of the United States has been elected by such an inward-looking electorate is a problem for the United States and even a, even a more, 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 more serious problem for the rest of the world. I think that's undoubtedly true, everything you just said. And uh, my favorite aunt used to say, after we snapped a picture of her, just give it five years and it'll look great. Um, but all kidding aside, um, I think that's partially true about the election, although I would qualify it. Um, Nevada is not on the West Coast. Colorado is not on the West Coast. New Mexico is not on the West Coast. Um, Arizona was closer than it's been in a very long time. The margin of victory in the so-called battleground states was as slim as it gets. And if you go back to 2012, the margin of victory for Obama in the battleground states, and many of them, was as slim as it gets. So I think you have to be very careful about jumping to conclusions about you know, what the electorate is telling you. Um, but here's what we do get from the data, the voters. As I said before, um, very few people are reminding us every day that uh, she will have won the popular vote by a margin that may be a record of more than two million votes. Um, and, and the people who voted, yes, they're on the East Coast and they're on the West Coast, but those people we're talking about are increasingly multicultural, multi-ethnic, very diverse, young and old alike, uh, male, female, and transgender, um, gay and lesbian. And that actually is the future of the 21st century, uh, certainly in America. That's where we're going. So. Um, I would hesitate to draw you know, some big conclusions just on the basis of the Electoral College, which twice now uh, since 2000 um, has returned somebody who got fewer votes than uh, the winner of the popular vote uh, to the White House. Um, I do think you know, the reason why I wanted to share this data is because I don't think uh, the electorate has been well served by the discussion of what matters most to them. I don't think the electorate has heard enough uh, from people who can report to them what the state of economic affairs is, even if it's not as good as it should be or once was, although it's questionable to say, you know, were we ever in some kind of golden age? When I was talking to Pre Professor Phelps about this very issue, uh, you know, I grew up in the 60s 
And I remember a, and Professor Sennett, in fact, referenced him, a Southern politician, uh, George Wallace, who had a very successful slogan, stand up for America. Sound familiar? And he did very well. He won Michigan, in fact. He won the state of Michigan. He won the state of Michigan when Michigan had an all-time high employment of everybody putting out automobiles, okay? That was the best we ever did in the 1960s, and George Wallace won Michigan. So I think there's something more going on here than sort of an economic backdrop, which the media likes to put in this box, and I don't think it's really um, as accurate as, as it's suggested. Padma. Professor Desai. Thank you, Professor Phelps. Um, I believe that so far, uh, monetary policy had to take the entire burden of propping up the economy since 2008 from the deep recession. Uh, budgetary policy in the form of expanding federal expenditures did not have much of a role because the Republican dominated Congress would not agree to budget to uh, uh, President Obama's proposals of federal uh, expansion of federal um, uh, budgetary uh, spending. Do you think that now we have a Republican president designate? and a Republican-dominated Congress, this situation would change, that fiscal policy would take some of a role of propping up the economy? Thank you. Again, I'm not qualified to make that judgment or provide that assessment. I can say this, the one thing these both, both of these candidates had in common was a commitment to infrastructure. And many economists have written quite uh, significantly about how important infrastructure in the United States is and how constructive it might be. So I like to think that, um, you know, maybe we'll get lucky here, uh, better, better lucky than smart, um, that we will see a, a fiscal policy that may have the impact. What would worry me, though, is if we have huge tax cuts at the same time that we have massive spending, and we've sort of been there before, and that's not a re recipe for long-term growth. Uh, I'm not the only one saying that, by the way. I'm just repeating what, what's been said. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. I will say this about you know, monetary policy. In the uh, almost three years, well, maybe it's longer than that, that Janet Yellen has been chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, you've had, even with recent events, the lowest volatility in the debt market of any Fed chair going all the way back to Paul Volcker. Okay, now granted, she didn't inherit the high interest rate regime that Alan Greenspan did, but it says something about the competence of the Fed under Janet Yellen, the first woman, by the way, made chair of the Fed in its 100-year history, that there was so much stability in the period that she took over as Fed chair. Philip? Do you have any disaggregated wage data that might indicate um, that there are pockets of the population that are kind of stuck? Um, I don't have specifically that data, but um, I'm sure we can get it. Um, you know, look, there are, there are certain industries, I, I'm not saying anything that isn't obvious, there are certain industries in the country, particularly where I think you come from, where uh, there has been a traumatic shift um, coal, for example, and people's lives have been completely uh, disrupted uh, for the worse because of it. Uh, it's by no means the only example, um, but it's a good one, and it helps explain why West Virginia uh, as a state is, you know, been convulsed politically uh, the way it has. Uh, that unfortunately is a fact of our time. You know, when people talk about, you know, NAFTA as being, you know, the enemy. I don't think NAFTA ever was the job creator or, or the job killer that either its enthusiasts or its detractors suggested. What it did do is it made the U.S. and Canada and Mexico much more efficient. And the proof of that, the proof of the U.S., Canada, Mexico 
connection being much more efficient as a region, is that when you look at the automobile industry today in the United States, it is actually today the most profitable of any automobile industry anywhere in the world, which is why everybody who makes automobiles or assembles them wants to be in the United States, whether it's BMW making most of, if not all of the SUVs that it makes for the world in Spartanburg, South Carolina, or SUVs coming out of Alabama from Mercedes. It's why uh, Nissan is in Smyrna, Tennessee, and Toyota's in Covington, Kentucky, and of course, Honda's been in Marysville, Ohio since the 70s. So everybody who makes cars and assembles them wants to be in the US. Why is that? Well, one, the market is pretty profitable, as I said, compared to everywhere else. The other is the efficiency. You can do more in the US market than you can do anywhere else. So none of what I just said was shared in any debate and any discussion about NAFTA over the past year. Georgetown, Kentucky. Sorry. Hi, uh, Ed Stringham, Hi. economist, Hi. Trinity College. Will you give your name, please? Forgive Ed, me. Ed Georgetown, Stringham. Kentucky. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ed Stringham from Trinity College in Connecticut. I was just curious. I liked your charts, but I'm curious how you started, how you decided where the X axis started. Some of them were 2009. Some of them were 2011. If we want to actually look at an accurate depiction of what happened over the eight years, why weren't you choosing 2008 to 2016, where we might have priced policies of the current president into them as they started? And then I'm also curious to know how you decided to have a positive or a negative assessment. So you showed about how there's a lack of corporate debt in America today, and you said, oh, this is amazing. And a lot of other people would say, well, this is terrible. Companies can't have access to debt. Uh, private equity firms uh, have highly leveraged companies and they're outperforming publicly traded firms because publicly traded firms don't have access to debt. Thank great, you. Great questions. And let's take the latter first. What I showed you was the debt ratio, which is different from debt. The debt ratio is a way to calculate, essentially, is a company able, given all kinds of risks, to deal with those risks going forward. It is not a, a data point that says this is the level of debt that a company has. So it's a very important distinction, okay? So that, that's why we use the debt ratio, not to show you um, essentially the level of borrowing of a company, but to show you how that company is operating with the debt that it has. So that, and, and by the way, that is not an original, uh, if you will, analysis. That's something that I think in, in all business schools, uh, when they look at, you know, how you look at companies, uh, that's one way to measure it. Now, in terms of data points and where we started, the first one goes all the way back 30 years. So this is the big one, the big picture of GDP. Uh, the reason why I picked um, 2009 in some cases is because I was trying to say, okay, this is a political year and we're measuring um, the performance of the most recent occupant. So might as well start when he started, which was in 2009. Simple as that. I wasn't uh, trying to be clever in any way, um, but we could have we could have started in, in 2008 if you like. But that's why we picked 2009. In terms of um, other years like 2011, we were looking at when did we start seeing the beginning of the recovery. Um, you know, the worst of the recession was in 2009. The recovery started. Uh, to be evident in 2010, but it was really in 2011 that we started to see uh, enough evidence to say this really is a recovery and, it, and it's unmistakable. So those were the assumptions. They weren't, you know, for anything other than that. That's the reason. Gil P. Zuega. Yes, one, one question about the media. So, so what, do you think, what do you think is the role of the media in particular, channels like Fox News in creating uh, maybe a, a false perception of, of these data and uh, a, a nation that is uh, incapable of compromising and, nego and, and, and uh, acting as one whole. Uh, yeah. um, I come from a very old-fashioned uh, school of best practices, starting with um, if it isn't true, it isn't news. Um, show don't tell 
which means instead of telling people what, it, what is happening, show them what is happening with anecdotes, examples, data. Uh, to me, that enables us to get closest to what is accurate. I think it's impossible to find the truth. That's almost, you know, like searching for the deity. But um, there is a way to inform people with facts and figures and context and perspective. It's a combination of language and arithmetic. And, you know, unfortunately, we're in the age, truth in the age of Twitter is horribly compromised. Uh, you know, misinformation and information are constantly competing with each other. Uh, in some ways, the opportunity for journalism is better than it's ever been because we have technological tools to get at data like the type that I showed you. And even if somebody quibbles with it or, or takes issue with its validity, at least it's a starting point. And the dis discussion should be data driven is what I'm saying. And the more data driven the discussion is, the less emotional it is, uh, the less ideological it is, and I hope the more informative it is. Last question or two. Going, going, gone, yes. Uh, microphone, stand up, give your name please. My name is Dallas Galvin and what I'm asking about is if you think about it, data as we all know in academia depends on, on the perspective that you want. The data that you've given suggests that everything is kind of peachy kino and that the media didn't mention those things. When you talk about infrastructure, are you thinking, because this is a conference on the working class, that somehow or another there will be so many more jobs that working class people can get together, form unions, and actually have a real income because clearly they don't have an income. Otherwise, they wouldn't have voted the way they did. It isn't a question just of not enough information, which I, I agree with you, in the media. They look at their paychecks every week and they know they're not doing well. What's the question? What was, what's the question? My question is, do you think that changes in infrastructure... Into the microphone, please. Oh, okay. Sorry. The, what you suggest is that the growth of infrastructure investment is somehow or another going to change things. And what I'm saying is that the people who voted more than likely for Trump, but in any case who vote every day by going to the bank and looking at their paychecks, know that this data that you've just shown is divine if you happen to be in the 100,000 up category. But for regular people, the reason they voted against Mrs. Clinton is in large measure because they didn't feel that they were okay. getting it. Do okay. you think okay. that the infrastructure yeah. increase will cause more union involvement and therefore an okay. increase in real salaries and real uh, okay. ability to... I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, and, and I think everybody in this room actually can relate to it. Uh, first of all, I would say infrastructure is not a panacea. Um, and it never will be. Um, there happens to be, however, a, a growing, accelerating need for infrastructure spending and improvement because our roads, our bridges, and I don't need to go any further, are in such disrepair, not to mention lots of schools and hospitals and so on. So it would be to our benefit as an economy to have these institutions fixed uh, for the better. And one of the byproducts or benefits, of course, is that we'll put a lot of people to work who otherwise wouldn't be working. Now, let me give you an example that's right here in our backyard. In 2009, um, the US government, thanks to Frank Lautenberg, had passed legislation that enabled the state of New Jersey for the first time to get money back in a big way that it had been giving to Wyoming. And what I'm talking about was the infrastructure plan to build a new tunnel under the Hudson River. Now, the year is 2009. We're in the depths of the Depression, OK? I think even people like Professor Phelps and um, Bill Howard. Yeah, would agree that was a good time to build a bridge and a tunnel, 
That was a really good time. For New Jersey, it was a really good time because the economy was in desperate shape, the housing industry was a shambles, uh, just the commitment to build that tunnel in 2009 would have had a knock-on effect for the housing industry, for business, and everything else. The governor, the new governor of New Jersey at the time, said he was worried about cost overruns at a time when we were entering maybe one of the greatest deflations in American history, when interest rates were headed for record lows. If ever there was a time to borrow money, 2009, 2010 was the period to do it. And the governor of New Jersey said, forget it. And we didn't do anything about it. That's why infrastructure matters. And that would have been a fabulous time to commit. And we could have done it. And there was the political will to do it in Washington. It just didn't happen locally in the state of New Jersey. Thank you very much, Thank Matthew. You. Let's give him a big Thank hand. You. Thank you.